Broadcasting from the Investor Hour studios and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere you find podcasts for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here's your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Before we get into today's episode, don't forget, Trish Regan is now a part of the Stansberry family. Check out her podcast, American Consequences with Trish Regan. The link will be in the description of this episode. As for today, we'll talk with trading legend and market wizard, Peter Brandt. I'll ask Peter about his relationship with Ronald McDonald, why the old chart patterns aren't working anymore, and then Peter says he wants to turn the tables and ask me a couple questions. That should be cool. This week in the mailbag, lots of great stuff. Feedback about our recent guests, Andrew Beer and Petey Mangan, and questions about inflation, Apple, Intel, and free speech on social media platforms. In my opening rant this week, I want plenty of time to talk with Peter Brandt, so I'll just quickly go over the most insane thing in the stock market right now. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. Okay, today's rant will be a little short. I want to leave plenty of time to talk with Peter Brandt. He's our second market wizard interview subject. Our first was Mark Minervini. All right, I can't wait to get to it. But first, there's no way, there is absolutely no way I can talk about anything else but GameStop and the ins and other stocks too. It's not just GameStop and the total insanity in the stock market right now. As I speak to you, there's a couple of stocks that are up like literally 100 or 200% in a single day. And GameStop is one of them. It's, it's gone absolutely ballistic just the last several days. AMC Theaters, the movie theater company, that's just had like the worst thing that could ever happen to it, which is still happening to it. Express, right? Express, the uh, the retail company. Cost Headphones is another one. They were up like last time I looked, you know, 100% or so. Just insane. Insane action. And look, we can get into why this is. The, the basic dynamic is probably just about right. It's the sort of thing that happens during these really manic episodes. People go on to places like Reddit, you know, social media platforms, and you know, they just talk up these stocks. They have no idea what they're doing. They're like, oh, buy, buy, buy. And there's a frenzy of buying that results from just a bunch of know-nothings piling into these, you know, in the case of GameStop, before it went ballistic, relatively small companies. You know, and the, and the share prices soar out of sight for no good reason at all. And these are garbage companies. GameStop sold their business that owned AT&T stores. All they have left is GameStop stores. You know, these places where people go to buy and sell and trade physical video games, like on discs, physical video games. It's ridiculous. It's, it's not anything you'd ever want to own. And AMC theaters, come on. I mean, these are like melting ice cubes. They weren't doing great before the pandemic. And now, they're, you know, they're doing even worse. Express, a retailer that you go to in the mall. I mean, there's, too, there's still too many malls. Austin Root at Stansbury pointed out this morning, he said, you know, people are also buying AMCX. It was up when I looked like 4 or 5% or something. Because they're mistakenly buying AMCX because they think it's AMC, right? It's just, it's all... It's all ridiculous. And you know what it is? It's things that happen at the top. It's classic speculative behavior. Now, of course, there is this extra little bit of juice in that, you know, some hedge funds were short these things in a massive way. And retail via Reddit message board posts seems to have kind of blown the shorts out of the water. Okay, fine. Big deal. It's still, this is stuff that happens at tops. Like a guy I know who's a, um, well, Vitaly Katzenelson, we've had him on the program. He's a great guy, friend of mine, good investor. He said his son was itching for him to buy GameStop. This was like a day or two ago on Twitter. And yes, in the past day or two, he would have like, you know, tripled or quadrupled his money or something crazy. 
But, you know, I think this stuff is going to crash. If it can soar 200% in one day for no good reason whatsoever, it can crash 50, 70, 90% in, in a very short period of time for no reason whatsoever, except to just get back to where it was, right? All this stuff is headed back to where it was. It's, it's insane. So the reason I'm not digging into it too deep is the point of this show is, you know, we're trying to help each other become better investors. Yeah, this is easy. Avoid. Walk around it. Don't do it. Don't go long. Don't go short. Just stay away from it. Really good traders never get involved in this garbage because they know there's no way, there's no way you have any clue of what's going to happen next. Eventually, will this stuff crash? Absolutely. But will it crash after it goes, you know, quadruples one more time? I don't know. Maybe. You know, is GameStop a 10x from here before it crashes? I don't know. Maybe. You get it? Sit back and watch. If you sit back and watch and don't let your money touch this garbage, you'll have a little bit of fun and you'll sleep well. That's that's my real message. I think that's the important message. The underlying potentially scandalous nature of the involvement of folks on Reddit or whatever, that might be a nice story too. But the real point is you should stay away. That's all I have to say about that. I'm going to do my quote of the week, which I think is appropriate for the moment. And then we're going to talk to the one and only Peter Brandt. So the quote of the week is from Charles McKay's classic book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. It's from right in the preface, right in the beginning of the book. You know, practically it's before page one even. McKay says, money has often been a cause of the delusion of multitudes. Sober nations have all at once become desperate gamblers and risked almost their existence upon the turn of a piece of paper. Men, it has been well said, think in herds. It will be seen that they go mad in herds while they only recover their senses slowly and one by one. That's Charles McKay from Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Especially that last part about, about recovering their senses slowly one by one. That's a, it's, it's a fairly famous quote. May, may, I bet, I'm willing to bet some of you have heard it, but you got to admit the timing is right for it. Okay? I think, I think McKay said it all. All right, let's do it, man. Let's talk with Peter Brandt. Let's do it right now. NASDAQ hit 13000 for the first time in history. Bitcoin topped $40,000 just days after cracking 30000 The words mania, euphoria, and frenzy are all over the financial press. But is there more to the story? You bet there is. And my good friend and longtime colleague, Dr. Steve Sugarud, who first warned of the cash panic in 2015, is now pounding the table about a dramatic financial event that has finally begun. Learn more absolutely free of charge by visiting 2021bullmarket.com. Again, 2021bullmarket.com. Check it out. Today's guest is the one and only Peter Brandt. Peter Brandt is the founder and CEO of Factor LLC, a proprietary trading firm founded in 1981 at the Chicago Board of Trade. Peter is considered one of the world's foremost authorities on using classical charting principles to trade futures, forex, and even crypto markets. His book, Diary of a Professional Commodity Trader, published by John Wiley & Sons, was the number one ranked financial book on Amazon for 25 weeks in 2011. Factor Research is based on four pillars, classical charting principles, aggressive risk management, the process of market speculation, and the importance of human elements of trading. I'm sure we're going to talk about all that today and more. Peter Brandt, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks. It's my, it's my pleasure and privilege to be with you, Dan. Okay. So, Peter, I've read – actually, I've read parts of – and I, th I think I've actually read the whole interview at this point of the Schwager book, Unknown Market Wizards. You're the first interview in Jack Schwager's new book. And we, we interviewed Jack and we talked a little bit about you then. And I usually talk with 
people in your business about, you know, how they got started and, you know, how they grew up and all that. But you mentioned a little bit of that in your book. And I want people to read the book because Schreiger's books are great. So, Peter, there's a question that I have got to start out with. After reading the Schreiger interview, there's no other topic that I could start out with. Please, Peter, tell me about your relationship with Ronald McDonald. Oh, boy. Um, you mean other than the <laughs> fact that I eat at McDonald's and every once in a while? Yeah. I, I mean, that's a fascinating part, right? I mean, yeah, talk about digging into the closet for that question. Well, you go way back. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, 50 years ago, uh, you know, out of college, I went into the advertising business. And uh, uh, that was my major, actually, a double major in college, uh, you know, economics, business, and then uh, journalism, advertising. So uh, I joined a very large agency, advertising agency in Chicago. We lived in Minnesota our whole lives and headed to Chicago. And it was one of the largest ad agencies in the world at the time with huge clients. One of those clients was McDonald's. And I ended up being assigned to the McDonald's account just about the time that, you know, Ronald McDonald was invented with his big shoes. And uh, so <laughs> that was that's my connection with Ronald McDonald. As uh, I was engaged in an ad agency where Ma Ronald McDonald, in effect, was born as as an effort to reach young kids and appeal uh, the McDonald's restaurant to, you know, entire families. So. Yeah. Boy, you went deep for that one, Dan. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So basically, you and Ronald go way back is what you're telling me. <laughs> we go way back. We're best friends. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, and it sounds like the relationship has continued, uh, you know, right up until today. Well, um, yeah, and it was because as a matter of fact, you know, I I worked on the McDonald's account in advertising. And then when I went over and um, became fascinated with commodity trading and left the advertising business and went to work uh, at the Chicago Board of Trade for a, a Continental Grain, which is a large grain merchandising firm. Uh, I, uh, one of my assignments was to go out and find uh, uh, institutional business that would do their grain trading and futures clearing through Continental. And I had a relationship with McDonald's at the time and, and ended up going to McDonald's and uh, signing them on as a client. So, you know, I saw uh, McDonald's from the advertising side, but then also uh, became very familiar with, with McDonald's from the standpoint of green merchandising and uh, purchasing and, and, and the commodity side, too. So it was an interesting uh, it was an interesting bookend there. That is so cool. So you know, I'm I, I'm now now that I'm talking with you, I'm one degree removed from from Ronald McDonald. It's great. You liked advertising, didn't you? It's not that you didn't like advertising. You just discovered trading and like and just re the trading bug bit you. But you liked advertising, didn't you? I did like advertising, uh, and I think I was good in it for a young guy to have me on a fast track. Um, I, I kind of didn't like the corporate world from the standpoint of, you know, writing memos and attending meetings. That's, that's not me. I'm more of an entrepreneurial guy, but I, I love the fascination of, of advertising. But then, you know, at the time I'm living in Chicago and, uh, I, we li actually lived in Evanston, which is a suburb north of Chicago and met a guy who was a, a, a soybean trader at the Chicago Board of Trade. And um, he, he asked me to come down and I had lunch with him a few times at the Chicago Board of Trade uh, member dining room overlooking the trading floor, overlooking corn and being the grain portion of the trading floor and absolutely became fascinated by that. I just uh, it, it was a world that I just uh, bewildered me. It was a wonder to me. And even though. I liked advertising, and at the time, you know, I'm a guy in my mid twenties, and I approached uh, uh, the founder of the ad agency. Uh, the, the agency name at the time was Needham Harper and Steers, and uh, I talked to Dick Needham and said, "Hey, I, I've got this bug that I've that I've got this itch in my back. I've got a scratch called commodity trading, and I'm going to go and uh, join the Chicago Board of Trade." 
And if I absolutely blow out uh, and it's not for me, well, you hire me back in a year at a, with a raise. And uh, Dick Needham said, sure, of course we will. And so that really gave me a plan B, right? I had the freedom to fly. And uh, so, you know, the rest is history. Went down the Chicago Board of Trade in early 1975. And I've gotten, you know, I've gotten old in the business. You know, I'm, I was in my mid-20s at the time. Now I'm, you know, in my mid-70s. And this is what I've been doing for the past 45 to 50 years. Wow. That's, a, that's an impressive uh, negotiation there, you know, just getting that, that deal worked out before you left advertising and, and for a raise even when you came back you're my hero right now <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh you you yeah you shop low if that's true yeah uh, yeah okay <laughs> uh, so but you started out as a broker you didn't start out trading but just as a way to get into the business what what was that experience like well it was a fascinating time because we had just come off you know, periods very stable and very low commodity prices throughout the, you know, 40s and 50s and 60s. And then we enter 70s. There was some crop failures around the world. There was some wild inflation that was taking place. And so, you know, 72, 73 really was the beginning of the mo modern commodity era as we know it. You know, gold, gold became uh, a legal thing to trade. Um, and so we had a lot of things taking place global macro wise and really you trace the, uh, the period of modern raw material, raw uh, commodity trading really back to a, just about the point that I came into the business. And so, you know, we, we got the big bull markets. We, we had these wild and crazy markets. And so that was fascinating. I knew at the time that I just wanted to trade. I, I mean, uh, th those are the folks that I met. I became friends with guys that were proprietary traders, that is trading for, with their own money for their own account. So I knew that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to be a proprietary trader and you're absolutely right. It's, back then there was no fast track into the business. There, you know, everybody started at the same place at the bottom. And, you know, and then um, you, you went from there. And so, you know, my original place in the business was to go find customers that could do their their commodity trading through Continental Grain. And, you know, I was able to sign up a couple of very large accounts. Well, that really allowed me to, uh, the ability to go out and then really seek the proprietary trading part of the business. I had to learn the business. I, I mean, Trading is a very hard thing to do. I, I knew nothing about the commodity business when I when I came into the business, and and so it really took me a period of four or five years to get my my footing under myself. I think I blew out three or four accounts. We we're allowed to trade for our own accounts back in those days, and uh, I think in the process of learning to be a trader, I you know I totally destroyed a few accounts and. You know, I really had to figure out what that looked like for me to be a trader. You know, I tried to trade based on supply and demand. And, you know, I tried a whole number of ways to try to approach the market uh, with my own risk positions. And, you know, you learn by your mistakes and you make mistakes and you you kind of refix things and repivot and try something else. And it really was about four years, I think, before. I could say, hey, I kind of know where I'm going. And then, of course, in uh, you know, 1975, when I came into the business, we really started uh, getting some traction as a trader in 79 and 80. And then in October of 1981, uh, I, I really left uh, Continental and went off on my own and started uh, factor research and trading at the Board of Trade as a proprietary trader. Very cool. Actually, just just a quick question. Um, it's just something that's kind of gnawing at me to ask you. Do you by any chance remember, Peter, what a round turn commission was when you started as a broker? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I sure do. Uh, I mean, if you're on the floor and, you know, I did enough business that I was able to gain access to the floor and you know, I wasn't in the pit. I wasn't a pit trader. 
I'll just right off on the edge of the pit. Uh, and, you know, back when you're on, on the floor, it was just, uh, you know, insignificant amount as a floor trader to clear your trades. But uh, as, uh, as a retail speculator back then, the round turn commissions ranged anywhere from 50 bucks to 75 bucks. I suppose there were some bucket shops that charged more. But, uh, a, you know, a retail trader was basically paying about $50 round turn commission. Uh, if you were a big uh, institutional customer, such as my institutional customers, McDonald's, Campbell Soup Company, and so forth, you know, they paid in the area of $15. And of course, you know, my round turn clear right now is less than five. So we've seen, uh, we've seen commission rates on, on futures go down uh, substantially over time. But back then, you know, commissions mounted to something. And because of that, uh, you know, at $50 round turn commission for a retail customer, the idea of day trading off the floor was really very rare back then because commissions would have eaten you alive. Uh, and so for the most part, if you were not on the floor, if you were off floor, you tended to end up really adopting more of a position overnight approach to markets where you held on to your position because it was really a rare day trader that could really cover that $50 round turn and, and make money at the end of uh, a month or so. Yeah. The reason I ask, I, I was, um, I wouldn't say the victim, but you know, the customer of, of such a bucket shop whose name I won't mention. And they were charging me in, I mean, this wasn't even the seventies or eighties. I think it was, or like, must've been early nineties. They were charging me like a hundred bucks round turn. And, uh, I turned 20, uh, was it? No, I turned $2,000 into $268 in about six or seven months. <laughs> <laughs> it was easy to do and you paid a hundred bucks, huh? <laughs> so, yeah, anyway. that, that, that you were not, that's not a novel story. And I mean, it was commissions that ate people alive and, Back then, the, the brokerage firms that were legitimate were very, very aware of something called, you know, a commission to equity ratio. And they, you know, they would be suspect of a broker who brought in uh, retail traders and, you know, had a commission to equity ratio that exceeded a certain part because they felt they had some liability there. And so it was something that you know, they, they would always take a look at a broker that it was called churning your customer. And, uh, yeah, we, yeah. a hundred dollar commission. That was, a, that was, a, uh, that was not uncommon at all. Yeah. So Peter, I want to sort of leapfrog ahead to that moment. It, maybe, maybe it was when you went off on your own in 1981, but I want you to talk about if you could, the first time you were really trading with a well thought out system that worked. When was that? Um, well, that's kind of a loaded question, right? Because, you know, <laughs> I would venture to say that there are days and weeks and months still where I kind of wonder, uh, do I have a well thought out system? Uh, I mean, <laughs> that's the reality of trading. Okay, well, wait a minute. So let, let, let me, let me tell you where the question came from. Like, I interviewed Mark Minervini, who was in the Stock Market Wizards book of, of Schwager, and he told me that he had worked on his system. He trades equities, and he told me he worked on his system for 10 years before it was really, you know, before he really had it down. And I guess maybe I'm maybe I'm projecting that onto you and saying, well, okay, well, how long did Peter work you know, on his system before he had it down? And if it doesn't apply, that's fine. But I'm just curious about, you know, when when did you start getting really systematic and doing things that are at least similar to what you're doing today is what I'm kind of after. Yeah, no, that that that's actually a great question. Uh, I would say late 79, I really had a sense of, of how I wanted to, generally speaking, approach the markets, what that looked like. Um, uh, and really started putting the meat on the bones to the way I wanted to trade. And uh, by mid 1980s, I, I pretty much 
uh, had a had a pretty good understanding of you know how am I going to select a trade, how am I going to size it, how, how am I going to determine my risk, how am I going to manage a trade once I put on, and so those were really things that that for the most part were in place by eighty one, and for sure in place you know when I launched the firm. Um, you know, the things have changed over time, of course. The markets change. We change our, our risk profile. We, we Our temperament changes. And so we fine-tune things, and we do things slightly di- different as things go on. But I would say, you know, in my mind, how I trade today you know, has a certain level of differences from how I traded in 1981. But I, I don't think somebody looking in, not really familiar with with the details of how I trade, they'd say, boy, they look pretty much the same. That in many ways, how I trade today resembles how I first started trading when when I went the, pro, the proper out only with factor trading back in 1981. And that's, you know, basically trading on classical charting. I was introduced to... Uh, Edwards and McGee and Schaubacher in 1979, and that really is how I started putting together my approach to trading based on classical charts and classical chart patterns. And, you know, when I first launched Factor Trading, uh, I traded classical chart patterns. That continues to be how I trade today. You know, there are differences today in how I manage trades and how I size trades, but for the most part, uh, the type of trades that I do today are exactly the kind of trades that I would have done back in 1980. Okay. And yet, in, in the Schweiger interview, I was kind of blown away. I wasn't surprised, but I was still a little blown away when you said, at one point, the old chart patterns just don't work anymore. And I was like, oh, so... I understand that, you know, some things have remained the same, but what is it? Are, are you still like, you're still a classical charting guy, but the old chart patterns don't work. Kind of help me resolve those two. What do you mean there? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there was a level of, of reliability that, you know, you, you would take a given pattern. Let's say take a, a head and shoulders pattern, a head and shoulders top, head and shoulders bottom, rectangle top, rectangle pattern that uh, you break out, I I think there was a higher level of reliability for those patterns to do what Schaubacher, Edwards, McGee would say they should do back in the 70s, in the 80s, even into the 90s than there are today. And I think that has to do with the fact that we see more false breakouts today. We see more breakouts that that don't work today than we did back then. And so I think there was a time back then where the patterns themselves really offered an edge to a trader who would be very disciplined in waiting for those patterns to develop and then jumping aboard those patterns when they broke out, that that in itself provided an edge to trading where I think that today there is a level of false breakouts and premature breakouts, head fakes that really have taken some of the edge, a lot of the edge, in fact, that classical charting offered back in those days has taken that away. And so We still have patterns today. We still have breakouts patterns today. It's still the way I trade today. But I think today I'm gaining my edge from really trade management, how I I manage trades, how I cut losses. Uh, That's where my edge is coming from is I think back then I could be pretty careless in terms of what a pattern was. I get, you know, if it looked like a pattern, it acted like a pattern, for the most part, it ended up working like a pattern, where I think a classical chartist in these days has to be much more choosy, much more picky 
uh, on the kind of patterns that we look for to trade. I, I mean, back then I would trade symmetrical triangles. I don't trade symmetrical triangles anymore because the level of unreliability of a symmetrical triangle today is so great that it, it would only cause frustration. There's no real edge, there's no real predictability. And so I think that's true for, uh, for a number of patterns that back in, in the early days I would have traded where I don't trade now just simply because I don't trust them. That uh, the level of unpredictability, the level of the high failure rate of those patterns are such that it's very, very difficult to make money in those patterns. So I tend now to really be focused on, you know, a narrow niche of patterns that I believe we still have the reliability. I mean, it doesn't mean that they work all the time. I mean, I'm, you know, I probably am wrong. I lose money on 50% of the trades I take out. Uh, and so that gives, you know, my default assumption is I'm going to be wrong on a trade. But and so the key now, rather than just simply some sort of magic that happens when a chart pattern develops, the key now is really cutting losses short and letting winning, winners run. It's, it's in those patterns that work to make sure that you have enough size and that you stay with it long enough that you can overtake, uh, you know, the 50% of the trades that are that are losers. And so, you know, if you say that 50% of patterns work and 50% of patterns don't work, there's no real edge there. The edge comes from how you manage trades within that structure. Right. So you're you ha you are assessing if it's 50-50, you have to be successful at basically assessing what we might call risk reward, right? So if here's you say here's my exit point that's down one unit but here's my potential you know or my my stop loss maybe is down one unit but then my potential profit is up you know three or five units or something like that is that the general thinking yeah i mean it it is uh, it, uh I, and i think it 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 can be expressed even with a little more specificity too dan it, there there was a 17th century uh, economist philosopher by the name of or 18th century Velvedo, Belfredo Pareto. And, you know, everybody's heard of the Pareto principle, right? That, you know, 20% uh, of, of events uh, really produce 80% of consequences. Uh, or in the world of trading, 20% of your trades produce 80% of your profits. And the Pareto principle really applies to just about every area of life that you that you look at. 20% of uh, parents will do 80% of the volunteer work at their kid's school. 20% uh, of people contribute 80% of the money to nonprofit organizations. Pareto principle rules lives. Uh, for me as a trader, I know that about 15% of my trades year to year will produce 85% of my profits. And so it's what happens with those 15% is my ability to let those 15% run and my ability uh, to really have the 85% not be big losers, to have the 85% scratch and uh, you know be net zero so that that 15% can represent my net profit over time. That really is the focus of, of, you know, that's my calculus uh, as a trader is uh, the way I the way I do that. Or I and I don't want to even give myself credit. The way that's done is to get out of losses really quickly to the old saying, cut losses short. When you have a loss, don't hang around. Don't, you know, don't live with a loss based on the hope that it won't. Get, become a worse loss. So when you get a loss, know when to cut it real quickly. And when you get a profit, it's the ability of that profit. And some, you know, sometimes you don't, uh, you don't see a profitable trade grow. It, it becomes a small profit and then ends up becoming a break even or a small loss even. But it's at 15% of trades. How do you harvest those 15% of the trades? So at the end of the year, those are really the only trades that, that count. Those are the trades that put in your net bottom line. 
unfortunately, you have to go through 100% of the trade in the process of discovery. Right, right. So uh, real quick, I just want to go back and ask you, Schaubacher was published in 1932, and Edwards and McGee is, what, 1948? If I read those yeah, books today, is that still valuable? Oh, you know, Schaubacher is, I mean, I, I've got to say that if I would have only read one book, and I've read a lot of books over time that are financial books, trading books, um, but if there was only one book that I can point to and say, this really was the book that gave me my career, it would be a technical analysis and stock market profits by Richard W. Schaubacher, which, by the way, has for the very first time been published uh, uh, in hardback uh, cover. It was a softback for, well, originally it was just notes that were Xerox, but then it became a softback cover, a covered book, and now is a hardback covered book as of the last couple of months. And, and that's available on Google, but uh, or Amazon. But yeah, I, I mean, that's really the book that defines, for the most part, how I look at markets. The lenses that I use to look at markets. Uh, Schabacher, his brother-in-law was uh, uh, was was Edwards, and so you know. When Schaubacher died early, very early, like 1936, he was still a young man. It was his brother-in-law, uh, Edwards, that kind of picked up his work and, and continued. And that's then how the Edwards and McGee uh, book came out, is Edwards had that, uh, had Schaubacher as his brother-in-law and, you know, picked up the work of Schaubacher and then published Technical Analysis uh, of, of stock trends. And so th that's kind of the lineage. But yeah, um, I highly recommend the Schaubacher book. In fact, I recommend the Schaubacher book more than I recommend Edwards and McGee, because, you know, why not go back to the origination? And Schaubacher is really the one who codified all of these things to begin with. Of course, you know, you had Dow and some of the early people were talking about these patterns, but it was really Schaubacher who kind of codified the whole th school of technical analysis that we refer to as classical charting. He was the one that put labels on it and names on it and you know, started creating uh, an organized way to look at it. Wow. So, so this book was first published in 1932, and you sound like you're still really enthusiastic about its ability to teach you something valuable even today, even as you admit that, you know, these old chart patterns, some of them just don't work anymore. I, I'm, I'm about to click on Amazon and I just bought the Schaubacher book. I'm not even a trader, but if Peter Brand says that's the book to buy, I have got to have it. So that impresses me. That's interesting. I, I have to find out what's in that book. What is in that book? Just sum it up for me. What's in that that's still valuable, not far from 100 years later here? Well, I think what he did is he accepted the fact that you, you have to have a lens that you put on, a pair of glasses you put on that, you know, that you can look at the markets and somehow start putting certain things in buckets, the way to understand the market. It's, it's a lens through which you can look that you can come to some sort of determination that defines not only what the markets have done, but maybe what they're doing now. And then, you know, stretching it into what might happen in the future. And the uniqueness of Schaubacher is he was he was considered one of the authorities on fundamental analysis back in the 1920s when he when he wrote this book on classical charting. At the time, he, he you know he had worked for the New York Central Bank. Uh, he had he was the uh, the editor of Forbes magazine. I mean, for the Forbes magazine goes way back into that period. He was he was recognized and acknowledged as one of the premier fundamental analysts on Wall Street. Uh, but he had observed that that prices, when plotted on a graph, 
tend to form certain repeatable geometric patterns. You know, we, we've all heard terms, diamonds, head and shoulders, triangles, rectangles, trend lines, gaps, all of these things. We, we've, you know, we've all grown up. If we haven't really been an adherent to those things, we've at least heard of those things. And it was Schaubacher that, chi that, or that organized these things into ideas and principles and concepts and put them into this book and said, here is what a head and shoulders really is. Um, you know, here is what are, here's, here are the components that are required to constitute a head and shoulders. Here are the components of price action when plotted on a graph that constitute a rectangle, that constitute a wedge, that constitute a diamond and so forth. And he was really the person, uh, who we can trace all of those things back to. And so that even today I'll see on social media a chart that somebody puts out and says uh, that they have drawn on there that here's here's a symmetrical triangle or here's a, a, a whatever the case may be. And I look at it and go, Schaubacher would not agree with you. That, 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 does, not def that does not meet the definition of a triangle as put forth by Schaubacher. And, and, and therefore you can't call it that. And, you know, I'll, I'll give people the latitude to say that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, but I want to look at charts. And when I identify a chart pattern, first thing I ask myself is, is this how Schaubacher would have defined this chart? And so I want to kind of hold myself uh, uh, accountable to the organizational principles of classical charting as put forth by Schaubacher in the 1933 book. Wow. Okay. But since we, since we kind of established that the, you know, these days the chart patterns are like a 50-50 proposition, let's talk about everything else. So what would that be like? Position sizing? and time in the trade or how, how you establish a stop loss, how you establish, you know, your profit targets. Tell me about that. How do you, let's start with position sizing. How do you think about that? Well, my first point is risk is, you know, position sizing is, is, a, is a variable and it's determined by where you get into a trade uh, and for me, that is when a trade breaks out and I have my definition, if I have a rectangle, I have a definition of, you know, how much of a breakout really constitutes a breakout. And, uh, and so I have my point of entry, which is represented by what I believe the price would be when a chart pattern is completed. And then I have a rule on how I set my initial risk. I always use stops on open on orders, I, on positions. I, I never go without stops. And so it's kind of like, here's where I'm going to get in. And here's where I'm going to get out initially if I'm wrong. And so you can calculate that. And then you can reduce that down to number of shares or number of contracts and futures contracts. And for me, that's determined by my risk. And my maximum risk uh, back in the early days of trading was 200 to 300 basis points of my total capital in an individual trade. Or in other words, on a million dollars, I was willing to risk, you know, somewhere in the area of 10,000 to 20,000 dollars, or you know, uh, you know, 100 to 200 basis points of risk on up to 300 basis points in some cases. Well, that's that's gone down over the years. As I've gotten a little bit older, as I've accumulated uh, capital and haven't, my goal hasn't been necessarily to make my account the biggest it could possibly be. Rather, it's tended to migrate more toward, I want to trade for income. Uh, my risk now is about 50 basis points. Now, what that means is that, uh, per let's say per a hundred thousand dollars i'll i'll bring the the i'll take a zero off the amount per a hundred thousand dollars of account size or nominal account size of what i have i'm willing to risk five hundred dollars on a trade and so if i'm buying a stock and it works out that uh i'm i'm buying um you know risking x number of dollars on on a stock i buy it at a hundred 
I'm risking $95 a share, that's $5 a share, and I'm risking a half of 1% or 50 basis points. You know, you just do the math. So that's how sizing occurs for me. Sizing is not my going in assumption. My going in assumption is how much am I going to risk on a trade? And then where I get in and where I get out are the determinants on what my size is. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. It's. It, I knew it was going to be risk based. Like all, you know, I've read the the Schreiger books and talked to a lot of traders, and we always wind up here. We always wind up in the same place. You know, it's about they're not looking up to see how much they're going to make. They're looking down first before anything else to see how much they could potentially lose. And in that same vein. You know, so that's position size, and we talked about this a little bit already. But maybe you could, if you care to drill down any more, or if you don't, it's fine with me. We can move on. About entry and exit, how quick? What is the stop loss point based on, and what is the you know the profit taking point based on? Yeah, and you know that's going to vary. You could talk to a hundred different guys who say they're classical charters, and you're going to get you know two hundred different answers to that one. Dan, but I can give you my answer real quickly. And, and, and that is, I base my trades uh, directionally based on weekly charts. I, I want to see things take place. I want to see patterns on weekly charts. But then in terms of tactically the execution of a trade, I go to the daily chart. And uh, so on a daily chart, you know, I'll look at a pattern, let's say, uh, it's a rectangle pattern, which means that there's a period of, of congestion, uh, consolidation in in a market where you've gone up and you find about approximately the same level where the market tops, uh, and then we get a reaction. You have kind of a same level in a congestion area where support is found, and so you have this. Uh, really is what Edwards and me call, McGee called a parallelogram. You have this area of congestion. There, there really looks like a rectangle or a parallelogram. And, you know, there, there's a point at which uh, the market thrusts through the upper boundary of that parallelogram and you have the breakout. And so that really defines where I'm going to get in. Where I'm going to get out is really, a, I use a simple rule, which I call the last day rule, is when a market breaks out of a chart pattern on daily chart, I identify the last full price bar that occurs uh, within that pattern. And if it's a long side trade, my stop then goes below the low of that last full price bar within a pattern. That is the point at which I put a stop and say, yeah, we've broken out and now the market has returned and, and gone back into this pattern that had been completed and even takes out the low of the last full price bar within that pattern. Um, you know, I'll say, okay, that's that's where that's where my risk point is. That's where I'll get out of a trade. Now, you, you asked about where do I get out if I'm right? And that is gets back to the principles in classical charting is when you have a congestion zone, you determine this, the, the height of that congestion zone. You, you go into a congestion zone in the stock between $80 a share and $100 a share for a period of time. And then you have a breakout is that's a $20 range. And so you extend that $20 range from the upper the, the upper level of that pattern. And so let's say you have a head and shoulders pattern, a bottom uh, that takes place and the height of that head and shoulders bottom is uh, 20, you know, $30 a share is the neckline, $10 a share is the bottom of the head, that's $20. When you break out, you assume the market's going to, going to move in a distance equal to the height of that pattern. So you have a target of $50. And so uh, for me, that becomes crucial because I want to take a pattern out uh, that gives me an opportunity to make some multiple, a multiple of what uh, I am willing to lose is what I want to make. And uh, so getting back to the Pareto principle, the calculus of me being profitable 
is based on the fact that out of 100 trades, uh, I can find 15 trades that will go to their target. And so that gives you then an idea of how dependable I need to have these patterns to deliver for me. I even need to have 15 patterns out of 100 break out and go to the target uh, for me, for my calculus to work. But that also then depends that 85 of those trades, I can find a way to at least break even. Wow. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for kind of digging in and explaining that in good detail for us. Peter, we've actually been talking a long time. Uh, we're, we're just about at the end here. Before the interview, you said you had questions for me, though. So um, before, we, before we finish up, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what was on your mind. Well, I mean, you're known and, you know, as a value investor, um, you know, going back to Ben Graham's book, right? I mean, is, is, is really kind of your hallmark. It's, it's, it's really something that defines you. It's something that I've never really dug into. I, I mean, I, I, but yet I, I think there's a whole generation of the younger traders now that value investing to them is this mysterious dark zone. Uh, you know, for one reason that value investing has not been in vogue here in recent years. And we've had a whole generation of traders come in through uh, crypto and Robin Hood and so forth. The value investing is, is this complete unknown. We do know that value stocks have underperformed tech stocks and growth stocks for a number of years. Do you see a day where value stocks will once again uh, claim a place at the table? That's a great question. You know, I, I've recently had to just stand back and say, what what am I talking about when I say value stocks? And and I'm afraid that when we use that term nowadays, if we're talking about anything meaningful, we're talking about the contents of value indexes, which as we know, like if you take like a Russell value index with a Russell growth index, there's actually a lot of overlap between the two. They have some of the same stocks in them. But they're just they just got there by a different means, right? It's revenue growth versus maybe price to book or price to earnings or price to cash flow or some constellation thereof. And so, you know, you have to sort of recognize what we mean by value stocks. Now, personally, I have made an evolution, which I'm not a billionaire, but I've made an evolution similarly similar to Warren Buffett. I think everybody has to. You know, the, the Ben Graham, you know, in security analysis, he he showed us these, um, you know, these metrics, right? Price to book and, you know, 60% of book value. I mean, he had all these very specific things, you know, and they were just, they've become the traditional value metrics. Well, you know, some people still do that, but I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's really hard because it's really much more efficient to do that with computers, and just sweep through the market and hoover up everything you can. And you got to have a lot of capital to do it, right? Because you're buying, you know, a thousand positions at a time or whatever. So that's, that's really hard to capture that effect anymore, I think. But I think what you can do, you know, on, on a repeatable basis, right? Every now and then, even over the past few years, value has, the, those value stocks have performed and even somewhat recently here. But you know, for a long-term strategy in the in the what I would still call the value discipline, you're thinking a lot more about it, it's all the Buffett stuff, right? Does this business have a sustainable competitive advantage? Do we like the management? And what does the the fundamental financial history look like? You know, what do the margins look like over time? What do the what does the free cash flow look like over time? You know, and why? right? Why are they able to do this? And will they be able to continue to do it based on what's happening right now? And then, you know, what we do is we think about all that. And then we 
we have this thing we do called price implied expectations where the traditional discounted cash flow, it's like you're, you plug in all these kind of predictions about what's going to happen in the future with revenues and margins and cash flow. And then you discount it back to the present and you do some math and then you get this intrinsic value number. But that looks too much like a prediction to me. And I hate prediction. I don't want a prediction-based strategy. So if you flip that on its head, and say, what do I have to plug in to get to the current market price? And did I have to plug in something that I think is too pessimistic? Because if it is, I think I might have an opportunity on the long side here. And if it's you know not pessimistic, maybe I'm having have something that's fairly valued. And if it's way optimistic, maybe I have something that's way overvalued, right? So that's the way we think about it now. At least that's the way I do it. And and Mike Barrett, my uh, Chief Research Officer in in our our in, at monthly advisory called Extreme Value. That's what we do now. So it's not really. I'm I'm wide open to finding a Ben Graham type opportunity, but you know most of them kind of deserve to be trading for less than net cash and all this other kind of Ben Graham things. So that's sort of where I am now. But to be specific, to answer your question, I th- suspect that we may get an opportunity. To, to buy those, you know, basically just call them the value indexes, you know, the value stocks by the traditional metrics. We might get an opportunity to buy them that will give us a couple of years of decent performance, you know, maybe starting soon, starting within the next couple of years. Um, I suspect, I don't have to predict it, but I suspect it's coming. And if it does arrive, I really hope that I'm smart enough to be there and take advantage of it. That that's fantastic. I, I love that answer. Uh, that's that that's a great answer because it, it really says, hey, markets do change. We need to constantly be looking at how we how we define uh, you know what's tradable for ourselves. And that ties to a different question. Coming from your background, I would love to hear your narrative for being a Bitcoin bull, because I know you've adopted uh, a constructive attitude toward toward Bitcoin. I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear your spin on why you believe Bitcoin is an attractive place to be parking money. So for me, Bitcoin is a burgeoning currency, a burgeoning store of value, and, you know, with very little history, very early days, of course, that has the potential to generate, you know, it's already generated from the bottom, from the beginning, it's already generated enormous, you know, tens of thousands of percent returns. But I think even from here, from, you know, whatever it is, 30 grand or so, it it has the potential to be like a multi-bagger, just call it, you know, like a 10x or 50x or something like that. And I think everyone ought to have, you know, just a tiny position, something you could afford to lose 100% of, and just let it go for 10 years. And that gets to the reasons why I specifically like it. The specific fundamentals are it is cryptographically secure. They they traded speed for security. Like one of the big criticisms is, you know, that transactions take too long, which is valid, but it's highly secure. And I believe it'll be much better managed, for example, than the biggest competition, which is the US dollar. I mean, we've printed three trillion of those this year. <laughs> and Bitcoin is close to, I haven't looked recently, but it's close to 19 million outstanding Bitcoin. I think it was like 18.6 or so the last time I looked recently. And there's never going to be more than 21 million of them. And, and if you know things go on as they are, that point won't arrive until the year 2140. So that's a pretty low, that's pretty low inflation. That's pretty darn good currency management. And there isn't a central bank behind it that's going to say, we have to do something that's going to make the stock market happy and we have to do something that's going to make voters happy. You know, it's a completely different motivation. And it's got this, you know, world's biggest computer network behind it. And, you know, with the the security, all of that security around it. So I just think it's really worth taking seriously. And I wish I had taken it seriously about 10 years earlier, but it really is worth taking seriously to me. Well, that that's fascinating. I I love uh, I, I love 
sharing the thinking of, you know, you, you have kind of what I call the cryptomaniacs and they, you know, you hear their narrative and sometimes it's a little wild and crazy. But I, I, I love when I run into people who have had a, a depth of learning the markets and a sophisticated way of understanding stock values migrate to, to, to Bitcoin. Uh, I love hearing the reasons why, because often they give me a richer sense for my understanding of Bitcoin. And I appreciate you doing that here today. It's my pleasure. I love having the tables turned on me by by Peter Brandt, of all people. I, it was unexpected. I thank you for that. That's great. But we are out of time. But I do have to ask you my one final question that I ask every guest I ever have. And that is, if you could leave our listeners with just one thought today, what would that be? Um, if you're a trader, it's more important for you to trade to live, not live to trade, that there are a lot of important things that we have in life. I've seen young people become just overly obsessed with with financial markets as the way that they define their lives and their world. And I just think there are richer things that we as individuals, as human beings, family, health, meaning, uh, things that we can be passionate about that will give us a fuller life than financial markets. And so I always, I want to trade to make my living, but I don't want to live to trade. And so that's what I would live pe leave people with. Very wise. I, I expected nothing less. It was very wise. Thank you, Peter. And thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. It was a great talk and I hope you can come back again. I feel like we just started and we have a lot more to talk about. Oh, I'd, I'd love to. And uh, it, it was a great interview. You asked me things that really I was not expecting and often don't hear that really allowed me to, I think, dig a little deeper into what I do and why I do it. So I really appreciated your, your questions, Dan. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I might have to, uh, I might have to tell the whole world over and over that Peter Brandt just said that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have a good day and thanks for inviting me on. All right. Bye-bye, Peter. Bye-bye. Wow. That was really terrific. Peter's the now the second market wizard that we've talked to. And just like with Mark Minervini, it was, a, for me, I hope you agree, it was a great conversation. And we went lots of fun places. I, I If you didn't listen to the Mark Minervini episode, just go back to InvestorHour.com and check it out because we, we talked about a lot of fun stuff with Mark too, you know, his music career and throwing a hundred dollars out the window. And, and, you know, here's Peter knows Ronald McDonald personally and has a long relationship with him. So that was a lot of fun. All right. That was great. Let's check out the mailbag. As a listener to this show, you know we don't talk politics, but there is a time and a place for it on our American Consequences podcast with Trish Regan, the famed financial and political journalist. Each week, Trish breaks down the latest news from D.C. and around the world with some expert guests, including economist Stephen Moore, Senator Marsha Blackburn, and Ron Paul. If you want to know how the latest political wheelings and dealings can affect the economy, American Consequences is the podcast for you. Check it out at AmericanConsequences.com slash podcast. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Just send your questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms to feedback at InvestorHour.com. I read as many emails as time allows, and I respond to as many as possible. Before I get into the mailbag, I want to make something clear about James W. with whom I disagreed last week. I think James is an ideal listener. He was very polite in his criticism. It was politely worded. He was slightly snarky, but okay, that's fine. It happens. I do the same thing, right? I do the same thing. But I just want James and everyone to know I disagreed with him quite passionately, but he's exactly the kind of person that I want, you know, listening to our show and and participating in this discussion that we have every week. So thank you, James W., for that. And I hope we'll hear a lot more from you and, and other folks like you. Vaughn M. is next. And Vaughn, I have to say, 
You're what I have in mind when I ask people not to write long emails. This is Vaughn's entire email. He says, what are some ways that the dollar could strengthen amidst the backdrop of printing and stimulating? Love your podcast, Vaughn M. Beautiful. So ways the dollar could strengthen amidst the backdrop of printing and stimulating. If you're printing to buy, if you're doing what the Fed does and you're marking up their accounts so that you can buy securities and and basically raise bank reserves, right? You you buy the securities owned by the bank and then they wind up with a dollar of reserves and and you, the Fed has their securities. That's a deflationary thing over time, right? It's just a swapping income out of the system and dollars into it. And then there's the whole prospect of, okay, when are these dollars and how are these dollars going to be lent and spent? And at what rate of, you know, what velocity, right? So there's that. That's that's my main answer to your question, Vaughn. You know, otherwise, if you're doing all this printing to finance fiscal stimulus, then you got a problem. Then, then maybe you got, you know, that can go too far and, and it can become inflationary. So that's all I'm going to say about it, but it's a good question. Next is James B. He says, Dan, I appreciate the effort you put into thought-provoking guests and the breadth of experience they have. And then he says, unfortunately, my broker does not offer TSX, that is to say stocks that trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange. My broker does not offer TSX stocks nor allow me to buy their pink sheets on the OTC market. Can you offer any advice about how I can get to these opportunities? Thank you in advance for your time and attention. Sincerely, James B. James B., you just got to find a broker that does it. There is no other answer that I can give you. I really have no, you know, if your broker doesn't do it, you got to put some money in with another broker who does it if you want to buy those stocks. Boom, period. Next comes Tarl K. Tarl says, it was encouraging and informative to hear all the tips on health and exercise from P.D. Mangan. I personally had success over many years with a similar strategy of eating whole foods and getting regular exercise, including weightlifting. Though I'm no expert, I must strongly disagree with the idea that dreading your workouts is correct. How can anyone hope to make a regular activity of something they dread? I think the opposite, in fact. You must make exercise a thing to look forward to. How? First, don't push yourself so hard. It's fine to have an intense workout, but going to this high muscle failure intensity is difficult mentally and physically. You don't need to go this hard to get stronger and experience health benefits. Second, you're supposed to feel better after the workout is over than when you started. Personally, I've never felt good after a go-to-failure type workout, just exhausted and weak. Thanks for all the great podcast, Dan. I was very excited when you took over the Investor Hour because Extreme Value has been my favorite newsletter to read since shortly after I became a Stansberry Alliance member in 2010, Tarl K. Thank you, Tarl, for reading Extreme Value and being a good podcast uh, guy. Tarl, I, I hear you. I, and I and I kind of agree. I don't think you need to push yourself to failure to get benefits of exercise. I think if you want to maximize the benefit and be as efficient as possible and work out, you know, 30 minutes a week and be as jacked <laughs> as Petey Mangan. I mean, that guy looks like a weightlifter and he works out, you know, two 30-minute workouts a week. It's amazing. And I have to say personally, though, I kind of disagree on the second thing. I, I, when I do something to failure, when I lift a weight and I can't do one more rep, um, I actually feel real good afterwards. So I, I'm not sure about that one. But, you know, overall, I see where you're coming from. However, this thing about dreading the workout, it's kind of like having a portfolio that you're too much in love with. You know, you don't want that. You want to have a portfolio where there is some, you're a little uncomfortable with some of it, right? You won't want to be totally in love with it. And I think this is in that vein. That's all I'm going to say about that. It's, it's a good question, though. It's, it's a fair point, I think. Taylor S. writes in and says, That rant at the end of last week's podcast was incredibly well said. I have a friend who used to use the phrase, I may not like what you have to say, but I'll defend your right to say it. It's not lost on me that he no longer uses that phrase. I strongly believe we are past the point of no return with free speech. It's now only free speech so long as you agree with the left. 
What last week's listener and many others fail to see is eventually the left will come knocking for them too. One can simply never be woke enough. Here's to hoping 2021 is at least a one-bagger from 2020. Or would it need to be a two-bagger to return to normal? I don't know if that makes any sense. Ha ha. Thanks, Taylor S. I hear you. I don't think I need to comment. Katine, she signs Katine. I think I'm, I believe that's a she. Katine says, love the show. You're always right. <laughs> and she has a little smiley face. Katine, I'm not always right, but I appreciate you saying that. I'll take it as a compliment. And, and don't let my wife hear you say that because she, when she says you're always right, she always, she's not very happy with me when she's saying that. Katine continues, can't help but want to comment on last week's show and all the letters and discussions you had in the mailbag about social media and censorship with so many folks writing in and saying, but they're private companies, they can do what they want. I have to disagree, and I hope you have some lawyers in your audience to comment on this. I'm no lawyer, but I try to like to try to argue like one. And first off, these are all public corporations. They're not private, and they cannot simply do as they please. They have shareholders and boards to answer to. I wonder... I have to wonder if all the more conservative Facebook shareholders got together to challenge the censorship if they'd have a case. Second, I'm going to pick through the terms and conditions of service, but my understanding is that while the platforms are free to users, there actually is consideration in that there is an exchange involved and one of value. In order to use these platforms, one has to agree to the terms of service, which in a nutshell say, we'll collect all this data from you and use it sell it for advertisers to target you. So I'm giving my data to them in exchange for free use of the platform. But now they've limited my free use of the platform, but they didn't stop using my data. What are your thoughts? Feel free to shout out the question to any attorney listeners, Katine. You know, uh, that's an interesting, that second part is really interesting take, and I'm glad you brought it up. As far as the public thing, you're right. They're not public in the sense of taxpayer funded, but it, so technically speaking, we we call them private companies. But they do answer to shareholders and boards. And where are the? That's right. Where are the shareholders and boards? It's a fair question. Robert H is next. He says, "Hi Dan, this podcast to me sets a new standard. I have no idea how I would have come across these hedge fund like opportunities without your efforts." Interviews like this hit it out of the park and keep me coming back for more. Robert is talking about last week's episode with Andrew Beer. He continues, since you regularly surprise listeners to the upside, I can't wait to see how you top this. No pressure. (laughs) Wink, wink. A question I wish you had asked. Do these funds remain 100-ish invested, 100%-ish invested, or do they reserve the option of going to some significant degree of cash if that is indicated? Following your recommendation of holding a cash reserve, I wonder whether funds like this do so as well. A reason I avoid mutual funds is because they generally remain fully invested, which in my humble opinion is a dangerous model. Great job, Robert H. So, Robert, I'm assuming that they do continue to be fully invested. And I, I didn't find anything that contradicted that in and looking around, just poking around in the material for them. So yeah, you know, you gotta, you have to want to stay in that strategy is the point of it. And that's what you're doing when you own that fund. Mike K is next. He writes in and says, hi, Dan, I did enjoy the Andrew Beer episode. I did look at the historical performance of DBEH, the long short ETF that Andrew's company Dynamic Beta runs has a short history of just over one year, but is impressive. One year return listed at 27%. I do like the lower fees. My question is, if this is attempting to mimic hedge fund activities, what is a typical long short hedge fund return for the industry? Are long short hedge funds typically outperforming the S&P 500? Just trying to gain additional information on whether I will consider DBEH for an investment. Thanks, Mike K. Mike, I started to look this up and then I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Whatever I find is going to be an average for the whole industry. I don't know how meaningful that is. To do this right, Mike, and I I couldn't take the time to do this. To do this right, you got to dig down into DBH and you got to know about the specific strategies. I don't think like a long, short, you know, hedge fund industry average over time is going to cut it. Maybe you could say, well, it should. 
I would kind of hope not. I would kind of hope that dynamic beta does a better job than the overall industry. That would be my hope. Anyway, that's that's my only thought about that. Laura G is next. She says, what are your thoughts on investing in Apple now because of its new in-house M1 chip running the PCs better and faster than those of Intel? Laura G. I don't think that's a reason to buy Apple or not buy Apple. It may be a reason to buy Intel or not buy Intel, but I don't think it's a reason to buy Apple or not. Luke T. writes in and says, I can understand the investing appeal of crypto and would love to get involved in direct purchase of crypto. Call me old, but I truly believe there are many, many like me with sizable investable assets but are afraid of the purchase process, not the blockchain technology, but the purchase process. Keep up the great podcast, Luke T. Luke, you got to bite the bullet, dude. You just got to go on to, I use Coinbase. Some people say Coinbase sucks. I don't know. Or Binance or or whatever your your flavor of crypto exchange, and you got to wade in and do it. I, that's all I got. There's no there's no getting around it. I don't know if anybody can make it simpler than just logging onto one of these websites. I found Coinbase like really super duper easy, easier than opening an E Trade or an Ameritrade or Fidelity, whatever kind of account online for you know to trade stocks. I found it much easier because there wasn't all the you know, regulatory rigmarole and back and forth that you get into and forms to fill out. It was like, boom, 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 easy peasy, and you're done in minutes. So don't be afraid. Just wade in. Wade on in and do it. Last one this week is from Edward L.M. Good evening, Dan. I thoroughly enjoy the podcast and look forward to it every week. I agree with you about the whole coup insurrection for the most part, What I am more concerned about is the underlying issues that cause people to feel and be disenfranchised. We saw this with all the rioting and looting in our cities this past summer. We saw organization from one side of the political aisle. Well, what happens when the other side gets some organization and starts protesting and rioting? An actual coup? Civil war? All this money they're printing will certainly not help people achieve the American dream that they feel they deserve. I have also heard of some surveys indicate large numbers of U.S. citizens are looking to travel abroad this summer. How much of any could all these dollars that will eventually find their way back into our banking system affect inflation? Coupled with the Fed actively trying to create inflation domestically, could this be the straw that breaks the camel's back? I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Keep up the great work. I'm not sure I get the question about travel. Dollars are printed. They go into the circulation. You know, maybe if you're suggesting that dollars printed by the Fed will be lent and spent as investments in travel or dollars printed and and spent by the federal government as some kind of stimulus or program or something will find their way into travel. I don't see where you're headed exactly there. I don't quite understand that, you know, lots of people traveling and spending their money in travel is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, in terms of inflation domestically. Uh, Maybe you could write back in, Edwin, and and clear that up. But yeah, I I like your comments about both sides of the aisle organizing and and protesting and rioting. An actual coup, I I seriously doubt it. Civil war, some people have used that. I kind of doubt it. I think, look, I think most people are going to sit on their couch and watch it all. It'll be riots in the streets. I, I don't think we're done with that. But the United States breaking down into, you know, actual civil war. I, I, I don't predict the future. I don't do that sort of thing, but I think it's unlikely. Probably a question we should ask, though, right? You're right to ask it. Well, that's another mailbag, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's try a new challenge this week. If you're listening to this episode right now and you're really enjoying it, send someone else a link to the podcast so we can continue to grow. Anyone you know who might also enjoy the show, just tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at InvestorHour.com. If you want to hear more from Stansberry Research, check out AmericanConsequences.com slash podcast. And do me a favor, subscribe to our show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at InvestorHour. Follow us on Twitter. Our handle there is at investor underscore hour. You have a guest you want me to interview? Drop me a note at feedback at investorhour.com. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email, feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.